conflict in the church. And we saw that scripture's answer for that is that if we believe that someone has sinned against us, we're to go to that person and try to get reconciliation so that the person who has sinned can apologize and repent, and the person who's been sinned against can forgive. And this week, we're just moving on to the next piece of the scripture. It flows naturally because it's directly following what we read last week. Because after Peter heard this, his question was, well, okay, we're supposed to forgive. Uh, but how do we forgive? And more particularly, how many times do we forgive? And so he says to Jesus, Now, Jesus, how many times is it that my brother can sin against me and that I still have to forgive him? Let's say up to seven times. And I always imagine him getting this look on his face like, Ah, pretty good answer, seven times. He's expecting this pat on the back from Jesus. Uh, but Jesus says, no, not seven times, 77 times. And he blows his answer out of the water. And there were a lot of teachings going on that day about how many times it was appropriate to forgive someone. And Peter thought that he had really outdone them. You know, there were some rabbis that looked at texts in Amos and Job, and they thought that it said that God only forgave three times. And so they said, you know, if God only forgives three times, we should only forgive, time, forgive three times, you know? And there were some other rabbis that looked at some other texts and deduced that we should forgive six times. They were twice as generous. You know, but this whole, whole idea was if God forgives this many times, then we should forgive that many times too. And so Peter may be thinking about these as he one-ups them and says seven times. But Jesus lets him know that it's not seven times, it's 77 times. And when he says that, he's not just giving us a literal number of 77, you know? Uh, I had some friends uh, that one day they were really getting on my nerves, and I had to forgive them two times in one day. And I let them know, I said, you know, I take the Bible literally, which means you have 75 chances left, so you better slow down on getting on my nerves. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, it's bigger than that. God forgives us more than 77 times, and we're also to forgive others more than that. As we look at the scripture, we can see that God's forgiveness is deep. That God forgives even the most heinous of sins, and even sins that we would consider to be minor, still have death as their punishment. So anytime God forgives, he is forgiving deeply. And so, Jesus answers Peter's question with a parable. And as we read this parable, it's in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, if you'll turn there with me. You'll see that he tells a story about a man who owed a great deal of money and was forgiven. And how he should have gone and forgiven someone else who owed him less. It was still a considerable sum, but it was certainly less than he had been forgiven. And so as we turn to Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21, let's look to see how this parable shows us how much God has forgiven us, and how we in turn should be able to forgive others. And so if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word, Matthew 18, starting at verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the king of heaven may be compared, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, with his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him, and forgave him the debt. But when that servant went out, he found his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and went and put him in prison, until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt, because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Please be seated. This 
parable was told 2,000 years ago, and so some of the details might not be that familiar to us. We don't have a lot of kings anymore. Uh, if I were to ask you for change for a talent, would you know how many denarii to give me? No one? And if someone goes into debt, you know, they typically just declare bankruptcy instead of being sold into slavery. So a lot of things about this parable have changed. If it were told today, it would probably sound a little something more like this. There was a man who had achieved a high position, and he had a large government program that he was running. He was actually given a budget of $6 billion to run this program. And as the year went on, some rumors started to fly around about how he was appropriating these funds. So at the end of the year, Congress called him up to put him on trial to find out how he'd used them. And so as this man came into the congressional chamber, you could see that he was trembling just a little bit. He was already red in the face, and you could see that he was sweating even before he sat down. And as the man sat down in front, they said to him, uh, Now, sir, we have heard that you may have been spending the $6 billion of taxpayer money that we gave you inappropriately. Can you please account for how you've been spending this? And the man uh, looked up at them, and you could see how nervous he was, and he just mumbled something into the microphone, hoping that they would let that be enough and just let him go. Uh, but the question was over $6 billion, and so they posed the question again. They said, sir, how did you spend $6 billion of the money that we gave you? So the man ventured an answer and said, uh, well, I, I may or may not have appropriated a certain portion of said funds on myself. I said, excuse me, sir, did you just say that you spent the money on yourself? How, how much of the money did you spend on yourself? Finally, he comes out with it. He says, I spent all of it. I spent every last dime on myself. I spent $6 billion on myself, and I don't have any of it left. And of course, they were furious. And they said, all right, you get a life sentence in Guantanamo Bay. We're sending you down there. We're throwing away the key, and you're never going to see the light of day again. And the man's sweat turned into tears, and he starts pleading. He says, no, no, no. I have a wife and kids. Don't send me away. I'll do anything. Just give me time. I'll work. I'll get the $6 billion back for you. And as they dragged him out of the room, the people said, oh, you know what, he's never going to pay that six billion back. But we're not going to get that back. Let's, let's just let him go. And they had pity on this man. And before they took him away, he said, wait, we forgive you the whole debt. Go and be free. And so the man had a new lease on life. And he left there, and you know, he had a song in his heart, and he was whistling, and he decided that the first thing that he would do now as a free man is go back to his second job. Uh, he had a second job as a used car salesman. Uh, <laughs> if you were wondering, this is of course how he learned all of his skills to get a congressional job with a six billion dollar budget. <laughs> and so as he goes back, he starts looking through his books and he notices that there's a man who has bought a car from him and he's a day late on his payment. And he still owes ten thousand dollars left on his car. And so he decides he's going to go down and investigate this ten thousand dollar loan that wasn't paid back on the, the right day. And so he drives all the way down, and he drives in a truck that's capable of repossessing this car. And he shows up there in the man's driveway, and he knocks on the door, and they have a little conversation. And as the man opens up the door, he says, Well, aren't you the guy that sold me my car? You know, what are you doing here in that wrecker? The man says, Look, buddy, when we, you know, we sat down and I sold you this car, didn't we not have a deal that you would pay me back the full amount? And I says, yes, you know, I know, and I know that I'm a little behind on my payments. You just give me a couple more days, I will have my next car payment. You know, we're doing everything we can, times are tight, you know, we're tightening our belts. I'll get you the money, just give me a couple of days. But the man who was just forgiven six billion dollars said to him, hey, look buddy, I'm not running a charity here, I'm running a business. You need to pay me the full ten thousand dollars today, or I'm taking away your car. And the man is shocked, he says, well, wait a second, wait a second. I need that car to get to work. I can't pay you back unless I have a vehicle to go earn that money. You know, if you take that away, I don't have anything left. You know, look, I've got a wife and kids to support here. Can't you just give me a couple of days? But as he was talking, the man who was just forgiven the $6 billion was taking that hook and putting it right into the car. And he drove away as the man was pleading. Now, the man who had his car repossessed, of course, was curious. And he took to the internet and he told everybody about it and it went viral. And pretty soon there was a big petition going up and it made its way all the way up to Congress and they found out what this man had done. And so they brought him back into the halls of Congress and they asked him, is it true? Did you do this thing everyone is saying you did? And the man had to admit that he did. <coughs> and Congress looked at him and they said, you are the scum of the earth. 
We forgave you six billion dollars, and you can't forgive someone ten thousand dollars? Shouldn't you have had mercy on that man as we had mercy on you? You know, we changed our mind about the sentence. You're going to go on to Unless, of course, you can pay back that six billion. And our Heavenly Father will do the same to us if we do not forgive our brothers and sisters when they sit against us. Now, this starts off by talking about an unimaginable debt. If you take this number that we have here in Scripture, move it over to today's currency, it's about six billion dollars. Now, we struggle enough with house payments and car payments. None of us can pay back six billion dollars. If we started working the day that you know Adam showed up and worked the last day, we still wouldn't come up with the six billion dollars. It's an outrageous figure to show us that we owe more than we can ever pay back. But what we owe to God is not just a financial debt, it's a sin debt. We saw it right there in the garden with Adam and Eve. God told them, in the day you eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, you will die. And when they ate of that tree in the garden, they racked up a debt that was as big as death itself. You God could have come right there and then and killed them. Could have killed them physically and spiritually. That could have been the end of humanity. But instead, he let them run up a tab. And the debt was held. And he told them, one day a man would come who would die for the sins of all of God's people, and he would pay that tab. But in the meantime, everyone was running up a large tab in front of God. A tab like a six billion dollar one. <clears throat> one that we could really only pay with our own death unless someone else paid for us. So we see at the very beginning that we have an unimaginable amount of debt before God. And because of this, because we owe God death itself, if he wanted to, he could say, you know what, it's time for your payment. <laughs> and if we die, it's not just physically, but spiritually as well, and God can separate us, self from him, we can separate us from himself forever, which is hell, and we would spend eternity there, because we could never pay back that debt any other way. And so God could send us to hell because of our debt. But as you continue on through the parable, you see this man who owes his debt and pleads for it, he's forgiven. And this is to show us that even though we can't pay back the debt, we can still plead for it to be paid for. We can pray to God and say, I know that I have an unimaginable debt. I know that only my death itself could pay for it. But I'm asking you, please have mercy on me. I, I can't work this debt off myself, but I know that Jesus has died, and he died in the place of all of your people. So please have mercy on me, and let Jesus' death count as my own death. And if we do that, then God says, you are forgiven. You don't have to work for the six billion, because I know you couldn't. I have pity on you and mercy on you, and because you have asked for forgiveness, I let Jesus' death count as your own. And at that particular moment, when we realize how massive our sin debt to God was, and how we would have gone to hell if it wasn't forgiven, but because we could ask Jesus for his death to count as ours, we have a new lease on life, we've been completely forgiven, and we can go out into the world as a completely new and free person. But the parable continues on, and it continues <coughs> on to see that this man had another fellow servant who also owed him a debt. And the debt was considerably smaller than his, it wasn't a six billion dollar debt, but it was about a ten thousand dollar debt, if you do the math between here and there. You know, ten thousand dollars is not a small amount of money. And sometimes people will sin against us, and it will not be a small thing. You know, as you're in this world, people will sin against you in one way or another if you're around people, and sometimes it's a small thing. And sometimes it's you know an unkind word between spouses.